Now, Nation, we all know how I feel about Slipknot. You guys are still viewing the video, you're still commenting the video, and liking it or disliking it, so I think that part is pretty clear. And, well, to be perfectly blunt, given some time, I think my feelings toward the band have kind of waned a little bit. Kind of like with ICP, where I just have kind of put things to rest. But now I have to talk about a Corey Taylor project, Stone Sour, with their new album, House of Golden Bones, Part 1. Uh, which just came out this past Tuesday. Now, really, whenever you compare the two bands, Stone Sour has been the band that I've enjoyed a little bit more. But for the most part, uh, it's been, you know, kind of hit or miss. Uh, everyone seemed to really like the song Bother, whereas, well, the song bothered me. I, I don't know, I just didn't really like it all that much. Maybe it was just the fact that I knew it was a Slipknot-style project and I was being a little biased back in the day, but who knows? House and Golden Bones, however, has gotten a lot of tremendous media attention, and it's also gotten a lot of potential references. References to albums such as Dirt by Alice in Chains, The Wall by Pink Floyd, Songs for the Deaf by Queens of the Stone Age. This is a, a lot of media people and a lot of the media saying that this is a landmark album for Stone Sour. So, of course, whenever I hear something like that, the curious side of me just comes right out and says, All right, I have to hear it for myself in order for me to believe it. Well, I believe it. I believe that this double concept album is a lot of potential. I think that this is an album that certainly, once we hear part two, kind of like with Winter Sun's Time, it'll feel complete, because while it doesn't really leave you on a total and complete, like, super-duper cliffhanger musically, uh, or kind of rush you into the idea of part two, it still leaves you with enough of a thirst to kind of hear what the second part is going to sound like. The way in which I'm able to really interpret this story is that there's a lot of internal dialogue going on. There's a lot of insanity involved with uh, the individual. And, you know, he's trying to collect himself and sort of, you know, take on, you know, the world around him whenever, obviously, there's many things that disturb him and trouble him and many things that are kind of causing him to be held back. Either that or many things that he's trying to overcome. And really, in a way, this is very well uh, illustrated through the music and, I gotta say it, especially the vocals that you hear on this record. The music is able to kind of, you know, do a 180 whenever it needs to from something very thrashy, something that has a lot of power chords and a lot of, you know, distinction to it. Uh, to something that's very soft, very mellow, to have that soft piano and maybe just a little bit of a, uh, of a bass line or a little bit of, a, of an acoustic guitar part in it. Corey Taylor's voice on this album is probably the best that I've ever heard on any of the releases that I've ever heard, whether it be Slipknot or Stone Sour. And the reason is, is because he doesn't necessarily on this album need to have a vocal identity, and because of that, he's actually established a vocal identity. He's showcased what he's been able to do with Slipknot, with the harsher vocals, but then at the same time with the cleans, it's almost like a battle. It's almost like at some points in time, he's that hard, gruff, uh, version of Jeff Tate, you know, in describing this concept album, in describing uh, the story through the lyrics. Almost like this is his version of Operation Mindcrime by that man, by Queen's Zareg. But the one voice that I hear probably the most is the voice of Fuel. Yeah, Brent from Fuel, the original singer of Fuel. I hear a ton of him uh, from Corey Taylor on this album, and quite honestly, it's a very, very very good feeling because that is a gentleman that I have missed for a long time. Uh, not to mention also, this is an album that definitely is perfectly suited for a voice such as that variety, mainly because the uh, the tuning and the uh, melody, the progression, everything really is just suited for that style of vocal. And man oh man, does it come forth uh, in a big way. This is an album that feels epic. It feels bigger than perhaps other albums would. It feels bigger than its predecessors. And it's probably because, in one part, it is a more ambitious project. Uh, but secondly, also, it's because the environment that surrounds it uh, really just suits it. Musically, it feels more diversified. There's a lot more uh, dynamacy to it. There's just a lot more... Uh, there's a lot more questioning because there's avenues that are being taken here that definitely would not have been considered before. While I wouldn't go so far to say that this is uh, the modern day version of The Wall, in fact, I wouldn't make that claim whatsoever. I think that what they really should do, instead of comparing this to The Wall, and it, it, they should just really say that this is this century's, you know, or this generation's House of Golden Bones. 
mainly because they do things and establish things on two separate planes. You can definitely understand that with the subject matter a little bit that the wall comparison definitely seems fitting. And with the depressive turn that uh, this album does take in some varieties, I can understand also the Alice in Chains Dirt impressions. And the music a little bit also, but really... Dirt is an album that really exists best on its own. It's one of the most depressing albums that you're ever going to hear out of the 90s, while at the same time sounding like it's just trying to absolutely rock your face off. This is an album where the comparison to Dirt works in that latter part where it is rocking your face off. This is what a hard rock album really these days should sound like. At points in time, you sometimes think, well, this is almost like a better version of an Avenged Sevenfold record or something like that, and considering I'm not that huge of an A7X fan, that you would think that'd be a negative thing. But in reality, the little minute changes that are made, the little subtle idiosyncrasies that really build this album up and really kind of draw you in, the allure factor that kind of, you know, magnetizes you to its center and kind of makes you curious about what else is in there, uh, just really is, it's intoxicating. It's definitely an intoxicating release. Now, there's also two tracks on here entitled The Travelers Part 1 and 2 that I have a feeling we're going to be seeing maybe a 3 and 4 or perhaps some sort of suite on uh, House of Golden Bones Part 2. I think this is going to be a reoccurring theme throughout the entirety of this two-album set. And I really like it because it's almost like a movement pause or like a shift change. Almost as though they're trying to go the Dream Theater Scenes of a Memory route, only instead of every single song being a separate scene, those songs are being used as dividers and kind of dividing the album in the thirds. It's really, really cool. I can't believe that I'm saying this, but I really am impressed by this release. While I'm not necessarily going to be singing the high praises by calling it like a 10 out of 10 or something like that, I mean, after all, I still do find some flaws in it. Overall, I do find some tracks, while they are ambitious and they do have a little bit of a thrashy element to it, uh, I do find some tracks to be a little bit, well... Not so much overdone, but I feel a little bit of, I heard this before in it, and I feel a little bit of, well, he's kind of blending a little bit too much of his previous work with Slipknot and with Stone Sour, whereas this is something that really works as, as itself, and so that can be a little bit distracting. And secondly, I find that the, I, I made that comparison to Jeff Tate a little bit earlier from Queensryche, I feel like this is almost like the poor man's Jeff Tate, uh, lyrically. While some of the lyrics that Corey Taylor is able to write do have a certain poignancy to them, at the same time, I'm finding some of the metaphor or some of just the basic elements of uh, the lyrical construction to be just a bit simplistic. But overall, if that's all that I'm really complaining about, and that's really nitpicking, to be honest, you're doing pretty well. Overall, musically, this is a pretty steady album. I really enjoy the flow on it. And for, given that it is a conceptual release, you definitely have to have... Uh, a suitable balance, but not to mention also a very, very good uh, flow to the album from start to finish, or in this case, from start to midpoint. And it really does have that, so that's something else that I'm pretty impressed with. They definitely took some time to make sure that this album flowed together like the concept album that they promised. So once again, in that regard, the comparisons to The Wall are fair. So, overall, my rating, well i got to give it an 8. It's pretty strong. I really like this disc, and I think that Part 2 is going to have a lot more to boast. So, Part 2, which is supposed to come sometime in early 2013, will once again be one of now three fucking artists uh, that are doing multi-part opuses. Winter Sun, Green Day, and now Stone Sour. Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a busy motherfucker. But anyways, guys, what do you guys think of this record? Do you think I've sold out because i am listened to a Stone Sour and reviewing a Stone Sour record and I just said that Stone Sour is great? Am I a hypocrite? I don't think I am. Quite honestly, I think I'm just being honest. And quite honestly, I think this record really is that good that it's going to make believers out of some disbelievers.